Hello and welcome to the Maker Studio Workshops. Today's workshop will be on the circuitry module in Tinkercad. Let's go through the slides first and then we'll cover how to use Tinkercad to build your own electrical circuits. And this software is online and free, so you can build prototypes of electrical circuits and test them before buying parts. So what is a circuit? A circuit refers to an electrical path that transmits electrical current. An electrical current, electricity, has measurements that consist of voltage, amperage, and current. Current is the name of the flow of electrons, or electricity, the stream of electrons. Voltage and amperage, on the other hand, are two different measurements of this current. So what is voltage? Let's use the water analogy. If you have a water system, then you have water pressure within the system. This is akin to voltage. If you measure how much water is in the entire system, for example, how big or how small the pipes are of this water system, that will define how much water is in the system and it changes the flow of the water. This is akin to amperage. So little pipes mean less water can flow, bigger pipes mean more water can flow. Now if we put this all together, you can see that a water system with high pressure and a huge amount of large pipes would be very dangerous if it started to leak because a whole bunch of water would be able to flow at the same time. This is the same for electricity. High voltage and high amperage systems are inherently dangerous, but what we're going to be creating today are going to be emulations of low voltage and low amperage systems that you can work with safely at home should you choose to get the components to build the circuit offline. So there are two measurements within an electrical circuit. Voltage and amperage are the two measurements that refer to the electrical current and then the flow of electrons. The voltage refers to the measure of pressure that allows the flow of electrons. And amperage is a measure of the volume or the amount of electrons. So high voltage is a high pressure and high amperage is many electrons. What is resistance? Remember when we were talking about how in a circuit that involves water, resistance is akin to having narrowed pipes where it would slow a giant river into, let's say, somebody's tap. The water exiting the tap would have a slower flow than that giant river. Resistance is a concept in electricity where that current, the amperage, is tuned. And it has to be tuned for various reasons. Some electrical systems are more specialized than others, and they can't accept currents that are rated too high. A great example of this is an integrated circuit or an IC. What that is, is it's a small chip that has a circuit built inside of it. The problem with one of those is that they are usually rated for 3.3 volts and a low current. And so it is important to limit the voltage and the amperage that gets into that component, that gets into that integrated circuit. That one ohm resistor in this case would create a voltage drop of 5.4 volts. And a one milliohm resistor will create a voltage drop of 8.4 volts which is nearly the entirety of the voltage that comes from the power supply, in this case, that 9-volt battery. So in this example, on the right-hand side, we can see how a power supply will have a positive terminal that is sending electricity through a circuit which creates resistance until it eventually feeds back to the negative terminal on the power supply. So what is amperage? When we refer to amperage, it's a measurement of the amount of the flow of electrons. So it's how many electrons will flow over a given amount of time. If there's a lot of electrons flowing in one second, that's high amperage. If there's a little bit of electrons flowing in one second, that is low amperage. And the unit of measurement for amperage is amperes or amps. A push button is added to this circuit now so that the circuit is open. You can see that there is no amperage being measured because there is no electricity flowing through this circuit. 
If a button is added, it breaks the circuit. It's an open circuit. And the only time that it's a closed circuit is when the button is pressed. Buttons are mechanical components that close or open depending on how they're designed. If a button is normally open, that means that it needs to be pressed and a physical metal strip will connect terminal 1 on the button to terminal 2. When the button is pressed, the circuit is closed and the electricity can flow. So the bottom example must have the button being pressed because it is reading the amperage and it's showing that that circuit has 5.45 amps traveling through it. So if we look at the example here again, amperage is the amount of electrons that can flow. So if the electrons are exiting from the positive terminal of the power supply, you can see that there will be a higher current or more of them. As soon as it hits the circuit, resistance is going to lower the amperage. It's harder for that many electrons to travel through the resistance of that circuit. When the electricity returns to the negative terminal, the current will have dropped. And as a result, the amperage will be lower. There will be less electrons. There's a concept in electrical design called Ohm's law. And what Ohm's law refers to is the relationship that voltage, amperage, and resistance have with one another. An easy breakdown for this is the various formulas themselves. You may remember this from classes you've taken in the past, or if this is new to you, that's just fine. Voltage can be calculated if you know the current or amperage that is in the circuit, as well as the total resistance over the circuit itself. The voltage required would be how much energy it would take to power that circuit. The amperage is a symbol, and it is I in this example. Amperage is the strength of an electrical current in amperes, and to calculate the strength of the amperage in a circuit, simply divide voltage by the resistance of the circuit itself. To calculate resistance, you will need to have both the voltage and the amperage in the circuit, and in this case, resistance is measured in ohms as the reduction of an electrical current's flow through the components of the circuit, so use the voltage that is available in the circuit divided by the current would mean the total resistance. So if you have two values of either three of these, the voltage, amperage, or resistance, you can move around the formula and use the correct mathematical calculation to be able to determine the missing value. This sounds very complicated at first, but what you should aim to do is learn how to test this in your circuits yourself. The math is very effective when you need to calculate what components you'll need to create the desired electrical effect. But while you're learning, you should be working with a multimeter and get used to taking readings of the voltage, the amperage, and the resistance within your circuit. Let's jump over to the Tinkercad website. This is the landing page for Tinkercad.com. And a backstory about Tinkercad is that it is an online software suite for 3D modeling and 3D design electronics design, and programming Arduinos. It was designed and developed by a company called Autodesk, and Autodesk is infamously known for a CAD modeling software program called AutoCAD. CAD is short for Computer Assisted Design, and what Autodesk was finding is that these kinds of skills that are required to work in AutoCAD, as well as to work in the other kinds of software they've developed, would have best been taught at younger grades or to people at an entry point that was easier to learn. So you can learn to 3D model, to prototype in electronics, or to program in a subset of C, Arduino, and easily do so, so that later on you can use your skills in a higher level environment for professional or personal practice. To get started, you have to make a free Tinkercad account. You have two options. Choose Join Now for a new account, or you can sign in with a sign-in partner. I've signed in with Google, 
If you have a Google account, you can choose this option. The first page that opens is the 3D Designs page. This is on the Maker Studio account that we share with community members, and so these are designs that were created by students, faculty, staff, and community of the Mount Royal University Library. We're going to click on the Circuits tab. In addition to the 3D Models tab, you have access to the Circuits tab, Code Blocks, and Lessons. Please click on the Circuits tab it will show a new view of the various circuits that have been created in this account. In addition to these projects that have already been created, there's a button that you can click that will create a new circuit. The website will now load the circuits module and you'll have a view of all of the various elements that make up this software. Take a look on the left hand side at the top and you'll notice a bin of tools. One of them is the Rotate tool, the Trash tool, the Undo tool, the Redo tool, as well as the Annotations tool and Hide Annotations tool. There is also a unique name that's created every time you open a new Tinkercad file. The problem with this is that it's a great name generator, but we don't want a random name. Instead, we want to name our project something that we can find later that is meaningful. I will call this demo for the internet circuits. When I look for this project later, if I need to edit it, or if somebody in the community wants to look at what we've created today, they can search for it by name, and they can also have access to it if it's in their account. For me, for instance, I will always be able to see this when I load into the circuits tab. Another main element here is the working plane. You can see that this large white space is akin to a desk. This is where you can place your circuits, your wires, components, breadboard, Arduino if you want it, and that is where you'll work. On the right hand side, we can see a bin of components. I want to point out that we're searching the basics component bin, and this will omit certain components. In addition, we can search for them by name, capacitor. But if you have the basic components selected, you won't be able to search all components. Notice how you can click to open the components tab and you'll have access to all components in addition to these various starter kits here. Please select all components for this workshop. You'll notice that there are a ton of components that are now available. You can scroll through them now just to check them out and notice that they're organized and labeled by their various uses. We have outputs for LEDs, NeoPixel displays, motors. We have our power section. We have breadboards and the microcontrollers you may have learned of from a previous workshop that you can program in Arduino. Another section that is important is where to find your multimeters as well as these other instruments that can be used to analyze an electrical signal. In addition, you can use integrated circuits. An integrated circuit is a small component that has a complex circuit built inside of it. Often called ICs, you can look them up by name online to find the schematics. This is the wiring diagrams of how to use them correctly in your circuits. Tinkercad really has quite a great selection of components. Let's just talk about components themselves, and we're going to drag out three popular ones. We'll drag out a resistor, an electrolytic or polarized capacitor, and we'll find an LED. When you click on a component, it becomes selected, and it shows it's selected because it is highlighted. It's showing its property panels, and in this case, you can see that the resistance value for this component is 1 kilo ohm. There's two things about a resistor. Resistors traditionally have been color-coded to indicate their resistance value, but here we can easily see that the resistance is 1 kilo ohm. If we enter 100 and change the value to be 100 ohms, three of the four bands on this four band resistor have now changed color. When you're working with an electrical component like a resistor, you'll have to use calculators to determine the resistor codes or values so that you can pull them out of your components that you physically have on your desk. 
But this simulator is really nice because it will show you what the common resistors that you're using will look like so that it allows you to build in memories of what these resistors look like depending on the colors that they are showing. If you would like to find a resistor value calculator, you can search for them by using Google. Type resistor value calculator and you should be able to find a few of these online. A good one to use is the DigiKeys resistor calculator. They're a reputable electronic component dealer. Here we can see how the calculator works. You'll enter the bands and it will calculate the resistor value for you. The tolerance is the last band and it is usually common to see gold or silver tolerances. 5%, a gold band, refers to that 1K resistor being accurate within a 5% tolerance. So that resistor can be off by 5% of 1K. So this is what a 1K ohm resistor looks like. So you can always use a calculator to determine the resistor codes. You can memorize them if you would like to, but the resistor calculators work while you're getting started. Let's now select our electrolytic or polarized capacitor. What this component can do is it can act like a bucket. A bucket can contain an amount of water depending on the size of the bucket. When the bucket is full, it will be poured out, and this component is very similar. Once the capacitor has filled with the electrical charge that it was designed to contain, it will discharge or it will release the entirety of that electrical capacitance in one go. As with all of the components in Tinkercad, if you click on the component, it will open a properties panel, which will allow you to change the properties as well as the unit of measurement. A polarized capacitor also has a negative terminal and a positive terminal, and we can see that just by looking at the component itself. The white stripe or gray stripe indicates that that is the negative terminal, and any time that we work with electronic components, it's good to imagine visual cues. The negative symbol looks like this negative stripe, and it helps you to remember which side to plug the ground signal into. Let's select our LED. An LED is a component that doesn't tell us much about itself until we start to work with it. All we can do is just change the color and the name that we have assigned to this LED. But when we work with the component, we'll start to learn a lot about electrical design. Let's just quickly change the name of this component to indicate it's a red LED. LEDs, or light-emitting diodes, rely on a principle called electroluminescence. This is created by having two plates of material that are semiconductors of different types of material, usually an N-type and a P-type semiconductor combination. When electricity is passed through the LEDs, semiconductive material, photons are released from the free electrons. And photons, as you know, are light. But the problem with an LED is that it has the potential to suck too much current. When an LED turns on, it can actually suck more current than it's safe to actually consume. So when an LED isn't used with a resistor, that bond wire inside of the LED that connects the anode to the cathode will actually get fried. So you should always use a resistor in pair with an LED so that you can limit the amount of current that will pass through that LED safely. Most of the 3 millimeter common LEDs will just require a 1 kilo ohm resistor. Let's also talk about batteries. We're going to drag out two batteries. Here we have a 9 volt battery and a 1.5 volt battery. These become the power supply for your electrical circuits. They contain acid and various metallic plates and this combination will generate an electrical voltage of up to the voltage indicated on the battery. In addition to using a battery by itself, these can be wired in series to increase the voltage. If you click on the 1.5 volt battery or the AA battery so that it is selected, you will be able to increase the battery count here. 
If you go to three batteries, it will show you that there are three batteries wired in series. And so this voltage will actually reflect a higher voltage. In this case, 1.5 volts times three. So the voltage should be 4.5 volts total in this three battery combination. But why don't we check to see if they're wired in series or in parallel by pulling out one of the multimeters in the instruments section. Multimeters generally look very different in real life, but the concept is simple. They have a display and they'll have settings to test various electrical principles. Let's wire this by connecting the negative terminal to the negative battery terminal and the positive terminal on the multimeter to the positive terminal on the battery. Let's test this now by clicking Start Simulation and you'll see that it, it is indeed 4.5 volts. So these batteries are wired in series. Let's just test this theory here and create a circuit that we actually wire them in parallel now. So we'll take out a 1.5 volt battery and we'll copy and paste that battery just with the command C, command V on a laptop, on a MacBook, or the control C, control V command on a PC. And we're now going to wire them in parallel. And what that means is that we will just simply connect the positive to the positive, the negative to the negative, and we'll take this and disconnect by deleting these wires here, clicking on them and deleting them when they're selected. And we're going to wire that multimeter in. Negative terminal to one of the negative terminals and the positive terminal to another positive terminal. Let's start simulation. And what we should see here is that the voltage hasn't increased. So this means that this two battery supply is actually only gonna be 1.5 volts. It's not 1.5 volts times two batteries because of how we've wired it. So now we can try wiring it a different way. And just to delete this, we're going to show you how series works. Let's delete the wires. And we're going to now create a circuit that jumps these together. So all we have to do is connect the positive to the negative. And now these are wired in series. So now what we, what we should have is three volts. And let's test that out and see. It forms a nice little triangle. So here we go. It's three volts. Awesome. So we've learned about parallel batteries wired in parallel. We've learned about batteries wired in series. Stop your simulation to be able to move any of your components around. So let's create a circuit. And in order for us to create a circuit, we usually should work with a breadboard. A breadboard is found in the breadboard section and it's used in a certain way. To use the zoom, two finger gesture and scroll up and down on your trackpad or use the scroll wheel on a mouse. So get a good view of your breadboard here so that you can see these terminals named one through 30. And what these are, the holes that accept the legs of various components. Usually a component will have uh, two up to however many terminals they're designed to have. And those will want, you'll want to place each terminal in its own section of the breadboard. For instance, do a demo of that with a resistor or a capacitor here. So we'll drag that out and you can see here that it'll snap to these terminals and they're connected now. We can move our component down a little bit here, this uh, ceramic capacitor. And we can see here that uh, terminal four on the breadboard and terminal five on the breadboard are now inhabited by this capacitor. So that means we can connect additional components or take wires out from the, those terminals. And now all we're doing here is we're just uh, connecting it to a positive and a negative terminal on the power rails. So let's talk about the power rails now. So these are conductive along the green line. And if you haven't seen from before, all of your central terminals here, lines one through 30, connect on a vertical plane. The ground rails are special because usually in an electrical circuit, there'll be many connections to power or ground. And in addition to that, there's only really one 
direction that they're sending or receiving electricity. Power is sending electricity out, and ground is closing a circuit and receiving electricity back. So these need to be where you would plug a battery in. And let's get started with that. So let's find a battery that we can use. In this case, why don't we try just the 9-volt battery? We'll drag a 9-volt battery out onto the working plane and zoom back in again. Now, if we look at any of the components that we have here, they'll actually tell us the names of their various terminals. What we can see with this ceramic capacitor here, this little blue capacitor, is it has terminal 1 and terminal 2. The ceramic capacitors don't require you plug the electricity in in a certain direction, not like the polarized or electrolytic capacitors do. The battery and the breadboard should have their components connected correctly. And the reason for this is so that you can tell what you've plugged into where. So the breadboard shows you or suggests you should plug the positive terminal on the battery to the positive terminals here on the power rails of your breadboard, and that you should do the same for the negative terminals. So when we connect them, we can easily see that if we take a wire out from here, we're taking a wire out from ground. Another way to easily tell what's a ground signal and what's a positive signal or a powered signal is that we need to color code our wires. And this is in order for people to, to maintain their safety when they're working with electricity. So you would never grab a live wire. You would never work with electricity that's plugged into the wall. You would never work with a component or a circuit you're building. If your power supply is plugged in and turned on, you want to disconnect your batteries. And the best way to indicate that you have a connection and that you know where power is supplied and where ground is supplied is by color coding. We'll always use a red wire for a power connection, and we'll always use a black wire for ground connection. And so now we can see here that the battery is connected to these power terminals. But what's interesting about a breadboard is it's split in half. So you can see here that this side is powered, but this side actually is not powered down here. For us to be able to share the electricity to the other side of the board, we need to physically wire it. So let's do so now. We can drag a wire over. And if you want to curve your wires, just click and it'll create these anchor points. And you can see I clicked twice. Technically, I clicked four times. But these are the anchor points that I can select and reposition if I want to. Just by selecting them, they turn white and dragging. Or I can hold Shift and I can arrange them together at the same time. So we've plugged in the ground to the other side, and we're going to change its color to be black. And now let's plug in power to the other side of the breadboard and change the color to indeed indicate that it's a power connection. OK, so let's delete our wires here for this little test circuit for fun. And we're going to create a real circuit. And at this point, we're going to use just the push button. and uh, one of the ways that you can plug these in that's effective um, is actually this is a rut. So when you buy a breadboard and you're working with it, this is actually a hollowed out space here. And it's actually used um, so that you can plug chips in easily to that. So we're going to go down and find an IC just for an example here so you can see. We'll just use a logic gate or something. And now you can see how the chip seats there very nicely. In addition, these push buttons sit there very nicely. So we'll delete that IC. So push buttons, these ones specifically have four terminals. And everything on the B side is connected. And everything on the A side is connected. But where they're not connected is terminal 2A to terminal 2B. So that's something to know right away is that they don't connect through the A to B ports. But they do connect between the 1 and 2. So now we're going to be working with a resistor and an LED. And first off, let's just find an LED that we can use here. So we're going to avoid, for now, the um, RGB LED in favor for just a standard LED and drag that onto your breadboard somewhere. Because this LED needs the current to be resisted, in this case, because 9 volts is going to have a high current, so the volts are voltage, but 9 volts comes with an amperage. So we need to limit the amount of amps that that LED can drain from that battery. So we'll take our resistor and we'll have to connect it to the cathode, or the negative terminal 
of the LED. And it is called the cathode because the LED has an anode and a cathode that jumps a little wire, which is the filament, and that's what creates the light. So we will have to rotate our resistor for it to plug across these terminals here. And so we'll need to select our resistor, and you can see deselect it and reselect it. And we'll rotate it and click on your working point to deselect it. And now we're going to drag it and connect it to the LED. And notice how it's perfectly spaced. So we have it plugged into these terminals. They're selected green and they're connected. And then we can look here that everything on this terminal is also connected here. So this is the very basics of this circuit. The one thing that's missing now is electricity and closing the circuit. So when we refer to something being a closed circuit, it has to be electrically conductive. So we'll start with the positive terminal. And we've connected that to the anode of the LED. And then we'll follow this along here. So that's how the electricity travels. And then it's supposed to go through the push button. But you'll notice something when we go here and plug it in. We'll change our colors, of course. That this circuit actually isn't closed. It's complete. But it's not a closed circuit until that button is pressed. And I'll show you how that works. When you click on the Start Simulation button, your simulator time should be incrementing. And if it's stuck at 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, <laughs> just press the URL and click Enter, and you can refresh your browser. So sometimes that can happen. So we'll have to start simulation again and it's incrementing just fine. Now notice how the LED isn't turned on. Well, that is because in a push button's case, a mechanical button, it, it, when it's pressed down, it physically touches the plates together, which conducts electricity and closes the circuit. So we're going to do that. And when we press it, the LED is turned on for however long we hold that button on. So let's get rid of our resistor and really see how much current here would it take to blow this LED. So with a nine volt battery, what we can do is we can just plug it in and that nine volt battery will have a certain amount of milliamps that it's going to be able to uh, send to that LED. And without the resistor to limit the amount of current, it will probably drain quite a bit. It won't be able to drain the battery like a short circuit, but it will break a component. So it'll damage this LED. We start the simulation and of course it's not damaged just yet because the push button hasn't been activated. When I press it though, that LED blows. And if you keep pressing that, that push button and you kind of just push your mouse up or something and hover over the LED while you're activating it, you can see here that the current through the LED is uh, 915 milliamps, but the absolute maximum current that that LED is rated for is 20 milliamps. So you can see it's a substantially higher number than the milliamps that the LED can safely consume or can safely be exposed to. And so now that LED is broken. And what happens to a component in real life when it's broken is it's no longer functioning and you have to throw it in the garbage. So when you're trying out the electrical circuits here and you're getting into electricity, always remember that this is a simulator and it is sure fun to play with electricity and try to blow things. But you have to understand that some of these components can actually explode. And so you would never want to do this with a battery or with a resistor or with especially an electrolytic capacitor, they definitely pop. Um, an LED is different because it's just a little filament wire. So just keep this in mind while you're learning electricity. Again, it's a very powerful skill to have, but with power comes responsibility. -da -da -da. <laughs> so use your education and what you're learning wisely. So we can stop our simulation at this point. And so now what we wanna do here is maybe do a little bit more of a complicated circuit. Let's start from fresh again and delete all of our wires that are connected to our components here in this circuit in the center and delete all of our components here. And we'll leave our breadboard wired and prepared to supply power. Okay, so let's create a circuit here that can be a night light. And what would that be? Well, we can use electricity and a sensor that can read how bright a room is. So I'm going to introduce a very common sensor that's easy to get started with called a photoresistor. And notice how, of course, the photoresistor, um, we need to change our view to be all components. We're looking for the input section. We want to select the photoresistor. 
So select it and drag it onto the working plane. And what a photoresistor is, is there's two basic types, but what they do is they have the ability to reduce their resistance based on the brightness of a room. So when the room is very bright, the component itself conducts less resistance. In essence, it's resisting less current. When the room is very dark, there's no potential for it to grab extra electrons through these plates. They're like nanometers apart from each other. But when it's bright in the room, the electrons can jump across those plates with more ease. When it's dark in the room though, there are electrical resistance raises. And so this sensor not only can tell that it's light or dark in the room, but how bright or how dark. And just to get started, let's start to wire this onto the breadboard. So we'll connect our photoresistor and the photoresistor, one of the legs immediately needs to go to ground. So if you don't accidentally um, connect these to these ports, but you want to bend a wire, make sure that you drag it and click in between the, the terminals on the breadboard, in this case, between terminal 20 and 21, and we'll connect it right to the ground terminal. We now need to connect this to a resistor. And the resistor we're going to use is going to be a seven kilo ohm resistor. So we'll drag that resistor onto the working plane, have it selected and change this to be seven kilo ohms. Remember it's how the wires, the color should change once it's changed here, we, the bottom color is actually purple. And let's rotate it so that we can place it on the breadboard. Drag the component onto the photoresistor's other terminal, so terminal one, and they're connected now. So you can see how these are connected. And then at this point, we want to actually supply power through to this resistor here. But we're also going to have to connect that resistor and that photo cell to another resistor that will go to a, a transistor. So let's just connect the power to that 1k resistor. So the only thing that's being done here is that resistance is either building or reducing inside of the circuit depending on what that photoresistor is doing. And this is almost a short circuit because there's also no load to be done with the circuit. So it's constantly just circling electricity through it. So technically, if you're working on this, you would want to make sure that your ground connection is not connected while you're making the circuits. We'll just do that. At this point, we need to grab another resistor. And in this case, we're going to be using a 10 kilo ohm resistor. Drag that resistor onto your working plane and change it to be 10 kilo ohms. And you'll notice how the colors on the uh, color bands here for the resistor codes have changed on this resistor. And we're just gonna sneakily drag this here and connect it across our board. So now we're working on another side of our board. And this is so we have more space and all we're trying to do is create a circuit that looks organized that we can read easily here. A couple of workarounds here would be to also change the wiring to match the so we can see how these are connected correctly now. Okay, so that resistor is, is going to have to go to the base of an NPN transistor. And so we need to find an NPN transistor. What a transistor is, is it's a switch, and it is an electrically engaged switch. So where we had a mechanical button that could be pressed that would close a circuit, what this will now do is once it receives a certain amount of electricity, it will turn a circuit on. So what that means is that the resistance on that photocell, once the room gets dark enough, it's actually going to start to turn on the other circuit that's going to be connected to the LED. Where we need to connect this resistor, the 10 kilo ohm resistor will be to the base of this transistor. And so we can see where the base is by hovering over the terminals and they're named. In addition, if you get really close to all of your components, and this is a nice touch with Tinkercad circuit module, is that you can actually see that they're very similar to what a component would look like. You can look up on Google and find the data sheet about that component. Tinkercad is very simplified, but it is very helpful that they have these little symbols in addition to indication of where the collector, base, and emitter are. And you can look at the PNP transistor, very similar but different. So you can see emitter. Well, the emitter is here, but look at how the component is shaped, right? The half moon shape. So we'll delete the PNP transistor. And now at this point, we wanna drag the NPN transistor somewhere that we can use it. So we, we know that that resistor is connected there because we can physically see it. That might not be very effective for some people to learn, though, if it's hard to be able to see what's plugged in where. But let's just do that for now so we can see that this these are all connected.
And at this point, we need to wire the LED to the emitter. So let's actually just take a cable here and jump it over a bit to give us some space. And we're going to find that LED now at this point. Drag the LED out. And we want it to be connected to the positive terminal. So this is where this is getting a little bit messy. And the cathode will be plugged into ground. And we'll change the color here to be black. Now we need to connect a 300 ohm resistor to the collector. Select our object, it's highlighted in blue, and rotate it. And now we're going to connect that to the collector. And the collector will connect to our 9 volt power supply. So the base is keeping track. And once the base is up to a certain voltage, it will connect the collector to the emitter. So let's go back to our battery. And now that we are our hands free from the circuit, and we're not touching it anymore in this simulation, we're going to connect our negative terminal and change it to be black. And now we can start our simulation. And there's something wrong. It says the current through the LED is too high. We might need to tune our resistors, but it's still working okay because it's not that much higher. It's 21 milliamps. So let's go and try our sensor. Can we actually get it to turn off? We can. And what we can do is we can increase the resistance on some of these resistors that will connect the voltage through the collector to the emitter so we can get it within a safe range of current. And it's as simple as increasing this to maybe be a different value here. So that's the night light circuit. So you can simulate electricity, plug it into a 9 volt battery, and you could buy these components and create this yourself so you could make your own night light. We've come to the end of our workshop, and if you enjoyed what you saw today, you can also check out the Arduino and Tinkercad workshop, which covers electrical design, in addition to programming an Arduino, so that you can control electricity with a programmed microcontroller. Thanks, everybody, and take care.